are welcome to be, all become members. It's a, a wonderful opportunity for us. It helps us with, with much of what we do here. Right. Do we have any members with us tonight? Doing great. We're doing great. Good, good, good. Thank you, all of you who have done that and if you're interested in that. We have membership forms on the side table along with a lot of other literature. Uh, as a member, of course, there's no charge for PC throughout the year. And uh, there's a 10% discount in the gift shop, so just keep that in mind. Room rentals, uh, so that's kind of another little hidden treasure that we have here that we don't tell about. We don't talk about as often as we probably we should. <laughs> yeah, we have two rooms that are available for rent. Uh, if you have a group or organization that is interested in holding a meeting like this, uh, this room that you're in, as you can see, is very reasonably priced for a, a meeting such as this. So you're welcome to speak to us about that if you would ever like to have a space to hold a meeting. Museum store, if you didn't get in to see Pam's gift shop downstairs, we encourage you to do that. It's stocked with lots of great things, some neat chocolate, some neat handmade items that are made by individuals in our day have programs. So the purchase of those items not only helps us, it helps the individuals in those programs as well. And before you leave, make sure if you're thirsty, stop in and get a cup of hot co cocoa or coffee to take with you. Mm -hmm. We have those available downstairs in our cafe. Uh, an upcoming event, I'd like you to save the date for Friday, April 25th at the Amherst Theater across from the South Campus of UB. We'll be having a, a, a spring event for our film festival. This is the first time we've attempted to do that. We haven't announced the name of the film yet because we're still selecting it, but we'd like you to join us and save that date to join us in April. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Doug Platt, our curator, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thanks, Doug. Hi everybody, thanks for coming out to the Museum of Disability Histories, Dialogue and Disability Speaker Series. I'm glad to see so many people are interested in our topic tonight, which is disability history is our history. And I think one of the things you'll find that Dr. Kim Nielsen has done is she hasn't done a straight chronological history, a timeline, a series of events that, you know, when put together, tell kind of a neat story. When you think about the melting pot, or perhaps top salad that American history is, you'll know that it, it, it really consists of marginalized groups finding their way under that big tent that we call society. And for people with disabilities, it's taken kind of the, a similar arc to other marginalized groups, but I'll leave that for Kim to expound on. And also, as people with disabilities, our people first. So Kim's done a great job of emphasizing personal stories and events that help have, uh, have helped to shape the society we exist in and are continuing to struggle to improve. So tonight, let me get this in order. Take a look at the Disability History of the United States by Kim Nielsen, which is available downstairs at our bookstore. And if you want, you could probably get the author to sign it. So. How about a big round of applause? For Kim Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you for coming out on this um, really lovely, cheerful evening outside. Um, I appreciate your, your willingness to be here on a Friday evening. Um, I came in from Toledo, Ohio, where it's it's very identical. <laughs> But I'm delighted to be here, and I look forward to any questions or comments you have as I finish, or even if I'm confusing as I go along, you may just wave something or have somebody next to you wave something, and I'd love to um, hear your thoughts or questions. What I'm hoping to do tonight is give you some examples of stories of people with disabilities who've shaped U.S. history. Some examples of the way in which our definitions of what is considered to be a disability change over time. I'm a historian and we really love change over time. <laughs> to look a little bit at how um, disability has shaped US laws, policies, culture, and then a little bit on, on just why I think the history of disabilities matters to all of us and is part of the history of all of us. Um, as you know, the history of North America is very long, and North America is a really big place. Um, so rather than keep you here for several weeks and going over everything, um, I'll be doing a little more select nature, okay? So please forgive me for everything I can't include this evening. 
Um, to historicize disability, this is something I, I do to start off with to give you a little bit of an idea of how definitions of disability change over time. Um, this is me, and I'm embarrassed to say that it took me about two hours to draw <laughs> um, with my limited computer skills, but um, this is me. And I use this to talk about the changing definitions and experiences of disability. That I wear contact lenses, glasses sometimes, um, and at this point in my life, it has relatively little impact on my daily activities. It's not a significant impairment. Um, I teach, I keep my job, I, they let me drive sometimes, you know, I move around the world. Um, 125 years ago, 200 years ago, my world would very much be that blurry blob. And my, um, what, to my t what today me has very little concept consequence, but my eyes, um, because of the lack of adaptive equipment that I use today, would have had very great consequence on my daily life. Um, whether I taught, it would have had great impact on how I read or if I read at all. It would have impact on how I did needlework, how I might collect eggs, how I cooked, um, how I um, picked mushrooms and poisoned my family, <laughs> whatever I would do, it, had very, it would have relatively significant impact on me. That's a way in which our definitions of what is a disability change over time. Um, then this middle arrow is um, pointing to my reproductive organs. Okay. <laughs> um, in 1873, a guy named Edward Clark, who was president of Harvard University, a very famous physician at this point in time, warned the nation that there was a very huge crisis. I'm going to talk about this more in a bit. But he said that there was a group of pale-faced, decrepit, weak, deformed women daily presented to view who've been tortured into a debility which renders their existence wretched. Does that sound awful? Okay, now this was a crisis. He said that the nation needed to do something about this. And what was causing this crisis is that women were going to college. <laughs> women were going to college and all of this stuff was happening to them. And while that was happening to them, it was, um, ruining their reproductive organs, and of course they were leaving college sterile. Simply that the, the education would cause women to be sterile. Now that's not true. <laughs> um, and, well, I, you know, I have relatives who think my PhD is a little weird. Um, they don't consider it to be a disability. But certainly Edward Clark, in 1873, would have considered my PhD to be a significant disabling factor on my body. So again, what is disability changes over time? Um, and then, <laughs> my lovely pants, which are in this picture. Um, I'm not wearing pants tonight. Um, but certainly at other points of time in US history, for me as a female to be wearing pants would have been read as proof of my psychiatric disability, perhaps proof of what was considered to be perversion, okay? um, that my body, my brain, my ways of thinking would have been read as very disabled simply by my pants. Okay? So people would have read my body differently. Now today, when we see women wearing pants, we don't read that as proof of disability. Okay? So our definitions of disability change over time. This is how I begin all my classes, so this is what you get today. Um, the U.S. is a story of democracy, and um, I'm going to argue and present that from the very beginning, as we as a nation begin to talk about democracy, that disability is at the core of those debates of what was believed to be democracy and what was talked about. Um, James Otis, the ta no taxation without representation guy that you all learned about, um, was an early theorist of the U.S. Revolution. He made the big claim, no taxation without representation, and he made a very revolutionary claim prior to the U.S. Revolution that people had rights. And that you had rights simply because you were a human being, that rights were one of the fundamental principles of law. He said we all have rights. All of us, however, except idiots and madmen. The 
These were the exemptions that Otis um, mentioned. Now he, he, appa he apparently made claims that even, he said, Native Americans, um, other people of color, women might have rights, but definitely not idiots or men. So at the very beginning, when people began to talk about what democracy was, and who should be included in democracy, that disability was at the very core of what people thought. Um, and Otis argued that certainly idiots or madmen, as the words that he used, were exempt from rights, that they did not have the rights that other people had. Um, I'm always struck by Otis, I'm really fascinated by him, because um, in 1775, year immediately prior to the revolution, his family had him declared non compos mentis, which means inco legally incompetent, and he lost all of his legal rights and was placed under guardianship, um, basically for the rest of his life. Um, so he became put into one of the, those categories of idiot or madman. Now, so in U.S. history, we have this linkage between capacity and rights. Um, when we vote, um, you may not agree with you know, the outcome sometimes, but the very premise of the vote is that we as citizens have the capacity to actually select someone. You may disagree with the results sometimes, but that people simply have the right, to the, not just the right, but the ability, the capacity to vote and to pick someone to vote for. Um, that there's reason behind that. Um, and that's been one of the big arguments for democracy from the very beginning that people begin to talk about that, is that human beings out there, even my neighbors I don't like, have capacity to vote and they can make those decisions. Um, so it's at the very groundwork of democracy. And to me, much of the story of disability in the United States is part of this conversation about democracy. Who has capacity? Who has rights? Who has the capacity to be a citizen? And, and that's the debate. Now, I'm getting my college lecture here. But one of the arguments against, um, uh, really against the capacity of people with disabilities or about that has been one way that rights have been denied is to categorize a group of people as disabled. And that's been done repeatedly throughout history, to categorize a group of people as disabled and thus deny them rights, whether that's rights to move around, rights to um, own property, rights to vote, rights for education, rights to um, marry, um, rights to bear children, um, the rights to simply live where they want to. Um, that groups defined as disabled have often been denied that because it's argued that they haven't had capacity for these rights. Now, um, different groups of people have been categorized as lacking of rights, um, as incapacitated and disabled. And I'd like to take you through some of these examples and some of the stories of US disability history. Um, the story of the ship La Radour, and I don't speak great French, so you'll just have to deal with my pronunciation, is one that has really haunted me for a very long time. And I've, I've really struggled with how to handle it, actually, emotionally. Um, the ship La Radour was in a uh, slave trading ship that left the, I'm not good at left and right, and east and west, would be the western coast of Africa to come to North America in 1819. Um, um, so it was actually at a point where the slave trade was fairly, the bringing of slaves to North America was fairly illegal, but this was, this was being done at this point in time. Um, and an eye disease hit the ship, a very contagious eye disease hit the ship. And it's estimated that about two-thirds of the people on the ship, first those enslaved in the very tight, crowded um, spaces in which they were being held, quickly, the eye disease quickly spread. It spread amongst the crew of the ship as well. And about two-thirds of the individuals um, were left with diminished eyesight, some completely blind, others blind in one eye, others with diminished eyesight. Um, now, the logic of slavery, or the illogic of slavery, was one <coughs> of and the, the selling of human beings. Slave traders knew 
that, in their words, those, even those blind of one eye would sell for a mere trifle because of the devaluing of disability and the erroneous assumption that people with disabilities can't labor. They also considered those above the on the ship to be cargo, just as cargo of plants or dishes or cloth. They had insured their cargo of human beings. Um, and they, they knew that under that is insurance policies, every slave that is lost will be made good by the underwriters. <coughs> Just as the captain had said later on. Um, the captain then had all of the enslaved who were impacted by the eye disease brought to the, the top of the ship. Clearly, I know nothing about ship language. The deck. The deck, thank you. <laughs> um, and ro rocks tied to them, and they were simply thrown over because of that diminished value. Um, they were called refuse slaves. Just as we know that many slaves in North America who had disabilities were called refuse slaves, or garbage. Garbage or refuse slaves. Um, and valued very little. Um, this is a painting that was made of the La Rodeur event um, afterwards. Um, but you see here an artist's rendition of that was being thrown at them, being, the individuals affected by blindness being thrown off. And to me, this is such a profound example of the ways in which the devaluing of people with disabilities, the devaluing of Africans in this case, um, blended together in really, really horrid ways. Um, but this is part of the, the history of disabilities within the United States. Now, this, this devaluing um, of both disabilities, people with disabilities, and um, those considered racially inferior went very much hand in hand. Um, one example of this is a physician named Samuel Cartwright. And Cartwright was a leading physician in the United States in the mid-19th century. And he argued in 1848 that slavery was actually beneficial because of what he called the inferior or inherently deformed, disabled African body. Um, and he even claimed that individuals had their own unique diseases who were of African descent. You see here how he met what, one of the consequences of medicalization, um, defining that. He, he diagnosed and identified individuals as having the disease of pedomania, which he said it caused the enslaved to attempt to escape. You can imagine all kinds of reasons why individuals might attempt slavery, and it was not disease usually. Um, he also diagnosed the disease habetitude, which he said caused laziness, shiftiness, and the damaging of property. So that those enslaved, he said, who were lazy, shifty, or damaged property, it was a sign of their, um, their disability, their deformity, their biological um, lack thereof. Um, so the categorization of people as disabled was one more excuse for hierarchy um, and one more excuse to treat individuals very, very badly in groups of people, to deny rights in this case. Again, ideologies of race and disability come hand in hand. Um, then we've got this Edward Clark again who doesn't like me and my PhD. Okay. Um, Again, Clark had said, you know, warning the nation of this great crisis, uh, the gravest alarm that should demand the serious attention of the country. Um, and he went on to say that an important group of people had been permanently disabled to a greater or lesser degree are fatally injured by these causes. And again, this cause was um, women going to college. So in this case, by categorizing the entire group of people, women, as biologically inferior, as deformed, as disabled, as lacking, he's able to justify hierarchy again. Um, so these are some of the ways that disability has been used as an ideologically um, to justify hierarchy, to deny rights to people. In this case, um, deny higher education to women, to say that there would be an education would cause them to be permanently disabled, and that, that was a terrible. And I had to throw this in. This is, of course, um, a group of college graduating women. 
um, debilitated into a wretched existence. Okay, so we're getting back to the capacity and rights. Um, this is an, an ar the argument that those considered disabled lacked capacity and should lack rights came out in many ways throughout US history. Um, this is a poster for female suffrage, okay, arguing that women should have the right to vote, um, and argued that you know, what a woman may be and yet not have the vote, that she could be a mayor, that she could be a nurse, a mother, a doctor, a teacher, or a, a factory hand, and yet you could have apparently all these slimy men who did get the vote, what a man may have been, and not yet lose the vote. Um, he could be a convict. He could be a lunatic. Okay, I'm apparently driven, this is supposed to be the moon, driven by the moon. Um, the proprietor of white slaves is talking about prostitution. Um, unfit for service. Um, the man needs to be um, crutches. And a drunkard. Um, so in this case, I think that the U.S. women's suffrage movement was using disability uh, um, and in essence arguing I'm not disabled as a female, I should deserve the vote, but also really saying all these other categories are inherently unfit, diminished, lacking capacity, and should lose the vote. It's really derogatory terms. Uh, this is very similar. <coughs> Um, where it's an argument for female suffrage, you have the respectable woman um, who her political peers in not voting are the idiot, the convict, the insane, and the American Indian. Um, yes, Doug? That's Frances Willard. Oh, okay, thank you. Frances Willard is suffragist and um, Cameron suffragist. Mm. Um, but looking at these other categories is diminished and disabled and, le and um, in this case, seem to be arguing should be lacking rights. A respectful woman not. And you see, I think also the racism within this one clearly regarding American Indians. Disability and ideas about disability have also shaped US history through immigration exclusions. Um, I always think about this, and um, my my family came to the United States um, in the mid-1920s, and um, I often think about this. Um, even prior to the creation of the United States, when Europeans began to arrive in North America, the colonies created exclusions of those they did not want to arrive in North America, um, and very much defined that by disability, that those they considered to be insane, to be lunatics, um, to be physically disabled, they did not want to arrive, and they wrote that into the law that those individuals were banned from entry into the colonies. And they often had ship captains then, at their own ship captain's expense, make sure that those individuals were sent back to wherever they had originally come from. Um, the 1905 Immigration Act banned people of poor physique from entering the United States. And poor physique was considered those who have a frail frame, flat chest, and are generally deficient in muscular development, undersized, or markedly of short stature to more. So even those, as we talk about who should be a good citizen, who should be allowed entry into the United States, disability was used as a means to reject individuals. Um, yeah. The Immigration Act of 1924, which was one of the most restrictive in U.S. history, <coughs> was much more specific. It banned those with epilepsy, imbeciles or feeble-minded persons, those of poor physique, the mentally or physically defective, um, such mental or physical defect being of a nature which may affect the ability of such alien to earn a living. Any mental abnormality whatsoever which justifies the statement that the alien is mentally defective. Um, all of those individuals could be banned from entering the United States. Um, and immigration officials were told to look out for such individuals. Now, um, as one entered Ellis Island, it was very much built, um, as individuals came to Ellis Island, they were, had to go through a variety of steps, up and down, sharp corners, turns, and through which immigration officials could actually observe them and watch 
and see how they moved about and how they carried things, how they interacted with other individuals. Um, and immigration officials would then, if there was somebody who was suspicious, have a piece of white chalk and simply put um, one of these markers on the back of the person with the white chalk if they were leery about this. So if I was um, observed to perhaps have a back impairment of one kind or another, someone would write a B on my back with the chalk. Um, if it was concerned that there was an impairment with my eyes, it would be the E. Um, L for, you see all the different varieties. Um, X for possible idiocy, X with a circle, definite idiocy. Um, pregnant, which I always wonder about. Um, the PG, the Special Inquiry Board meant they thought something was supposedly wrong with you, but they weren't sure what, so you'd be sent to the Special Inquiry Board to have that checked out further, um, where you'd spend time with officials. Um, trachoma is, a, um, is an eye um, infection that can affect individuals. So this is part of the immigration process. Um, here you see ways in which immigration officials actually look down at those waiting to inspect them. As individuals would be down in some of these bottom chairs um, and the immigration officials would be up top watching to see how people moved about, how you sat, um, how you interacted with other individuals. Um, here's part of the physical inspection. Okay, that was done. Um, in this case of young men, I think they're doing a trachoma um, test here. Um, another part of the physical inspection of individuals. It's done very close. <coughs> then I wanted to tell you about a, an individual who um, I have, I can say I have a historical crush on. <laughs> Charles Steinmetz is long dead and I don't think my sweetie has to worry, but um, I have this thing for Charles Steinmetz. Um, Steinmetz was um, a man who gained a PhD in um, math and engineering in um, Prague. He was, um, came to the United States in 1889. He um, was also Jewish and had been really in some ways um, chased out by fear of violence against him. Um, as you see, he was a man with um, a back that was somewhat he was of short stature, his back was fairly twisted, um, and he moved with a sort of a, let's say a dance-like gait, um, uneven gait as he moved through the world. Um, so he came to the United States in 1889. At that point, he had no money whatsoever. He hardly knew English, um, but he wanted to work and live in the United States. He was, um, it's, it's reported, turned away initially, as defective as falling under those categories that you've seen before because of his disability. Um, the story is always a little vague here, but he was traveling with a young man from England whom he'd gone through his PhD program with, and his friend was not wealthy by any means, but had some cash. And the sort of underground story and suspicion is that his friend bribed the immigration officials to let Charles Steinmetz in. Um, and I'm sure that never has ever, ever happened since, ever. <laughs> But Steinmetz got into the country. Um, he became the leading engineer for General Electric. He um, lived in, Mike, help me out, the name of the town I could never say, Stenechtedi. I'm not Thank you. That place. He lived there. Um, he became president of the school board. He was on the city council. Um, he apparently gave Christmas, though he was Jewish, he gave Christmas presents to all the orphans in town every year. Um, he made a very mean meatloaf <laughs> that all of his friends adored. Um, and apparently he was quite the marvelous, marvelous character, okay? Um, but this is one of the individuals who, in many ways, should have been kept out by U.S. law and the bans upon people with disabilities coming to the United States. Um, but by quirk or by accident, um, came into the country and was a marvelous citizen. And, um, he actually invented the electric car long before anybody else used it. And then, of course, they all said, who'd want an electric car? We like gas engines. Um, and so that idea got dumped. Another issue.
issue which has really affected the lives of people with disabilities in the United States um, is st forced sterilization. Um, the U.S., beginning at the early part of the 20th century, in 1907 is the first one, um, began to pass laws sterilizing um, targeted groups of peoples under the argument that, in essence, the nation would be better off without them, and without them reproducing, that they would reproduce bad peoples, bad citizens. Um, the model sterilization law, which um, was encouraged across the nation, certainly was not passed in, most sta in many states, but was put forward as the model, um, included that those who are considered feeble-minded, insane, criminalistic, as you see here, including the delinquent and wayward, the epileptic, inebriate, including drug habituates, diseased, including the tuberculous, the syphilitic, leprous, others with chronic infectious and legally segregable diseases, blind, deaf, deformed, including the crippled, the dependent, including the orphans, the ne'er-do-wells, the homeless, tramps, and paupers. All be eligible for sterilization um, if decided by the states to do so. And this, these categories are always, I mean, one, it's incredibly broad, is it not? Think about that. Um, and I also suspect that all of us fall in one of those categories. Mm -hmm. um, I often feel like a nerdy one. <laughs> um, that we all fall within these categories and are all very suspect. Um, the Supreme Court ruled in 1927 that this was legal, and stats, states could pass sterilization laws. Um, in a case called Buck v. Bell, Kerry Buck, in 1927. Um, and the Supreme Court said it would be strange if it, we, the state, could not call upon those who already sap the strength of the state. So they're considering people with disabilities to be sapping the strength of the state, to be weakening the very nation. Um, for these lesser sacrifices, often not felt to be such by those concerned, in order to prevent our being swamped with incompetence. <coughs> Um, and argue that it's better for the world, all the world, if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring, um, that we simply completely go off onto the floor with our quotes, um, but, but then sterilize those people. That this was the sacrifice that should be asked and demanded of, of um, so many people considered to be disabled. Uh, this is a photograph of Carrie Buck, um, the young woman whose case made it up to the Supreme Court and her mother, um, who both were institutionalized in Virginia. Um, her mother, for a very long time, Carrie Buck, was released after her sterilization. Um, the Supreme Court ruling um, is very famous for its phrase, three generations of imbeciles is enough. Carrie Buck had been pregnant, had, had given the court at home. Did I get it right? Okay, good. Um, that Carrie Buck had been pregnant, she had given birth, um, she'd been raped actually by a relative um, of the family she was living with. She had given birth to a young daughter who was diagnosed at a very young age, less than a year, to be um, an imbecile. And um, the Supreme Court decided three generations of imbeciles is enough, as the phrase went, and um, okay, legalized sterilization for those considered to sap the strength of the state. Um, this is a chart of the states that did pass forced sterilization laws, um, when and the numbers in which they did so. Let's see, California is huge, to over 20,000 people sterilized. Um, New York, relatively low at 22. Um, Virginia, over 8,000. But all of this and this, the argument that people under these categories, disabled people, people considered to be disabled, were weakened the very nation. Yes, when you're talking about these counts, uh, how does this document do the court cases or just institutional records? Um, my understanding is that it's institutional records yeah. of, of those who've gone through the sterilization. Yeah, and I did not put these counts together that another historian did. 
Yeah, it's over 66,000 people were sterilized between 27 and the early 60s. And one of the big advocates for sterilization was Paul Popno in California. So if you really wanted to be sterilized, you'd be a woman, Hispanic, suspected feeble-minded person in California, or you'd be a woman, African-American, suspected feeble-minded in Virginia or North Carolina. The majority were women, but certainly men were sterilized as well under this act, and the proportions varied from state to state. Most were institutionalized, but many were not. Um, I've been working on a woman from Minnesota um, who had um, three children. Um, she and her husband had lost their farm in the early 1930s through the Depression. They sought food from the county welfare agencies, um, clothing for their children in a Minnesota winter. She was told that she could get food assistance, clothing for her children, but only if she agreed to be sterilized. Because clearly the argument went being poor and in such need was proof of um, their disability and their inferiority as citizens. Um, and she agreed to be sterilized. She wanted to feed her children. Another factor which has really influenced disability in our culture and one of the ways in which many people have become disabled in US history is simply through work labor um, and industrialization. Um, this is a photograph of a Homestead Steel employee and his family who had um, lost his arm in the Homestead Steel plant. Um, he's got these, what, four kids and um, his female partner. And this is the caption um, that was given the photo when it was taken in the early part of the 20th century. One arm and four children. And industrial labor was and remains very, very dangerous. Yeah, is that Heinz caption yes. of it? Or, oh, yeah, was it a report? Or was it this is within a report done by Crystal Eastman. Um, I don't know if it was he or her that did the caption. Yeah, it is. I don't know how that's. That would be interesting. Yeah. Um, and this report is really interesting because Crystal Eastman um, was a, a, a reformer and labor investigator at the early part of the 20th century. And she talked to people who said, oh no, I've never been hurt at work. And then she talked to them, she asked more questions, and they were missing many fingers, you know, they'd been hit on the head and once spent six months out of work because their skull was broken, um, you know, they, they'd done all these other things. But that was so routine. It was just such a routine part of the labor experience that, in essence, being really hurt at work meant you were in the, the conversations that she had with many people. Um, this is a, simply a common part of the everyday experience. And for many of us, it remains a common part of our everyday work experience in terms of repetitive motion injuries. Um, work still um, is very um, disabling. Um, throughout US history, there's also been the notion that people with disabilities have an inability to labor. This is not true, and often despite reality in front of people, that's been the assumption still that people with disabilities cannot labor. Um, and that's meant often to employment discrimination. Um, this is the case of Shirley and Bernard DeMarco from Dubuque, Iowa, who both were deaf. They were a couple who met at a deaf club playing cards. They'd fallen in love, had a couple kids. Um, during the Depression, they lost their jobs. Um, during the Depression, in which 20% of people were employed overall, 44% of deaf workers had lost their jobs. So in many cases, people with disabilities lost work at much higher rates than those without. Um, when Bernard and Shirley went to find work through the Work Project Administration, which provided employment for people and built parks and streets and buildings and all kinds of things, they found that deaf people were categorized as unemployable by the Work Projects Administration, and they could not get jobs through WPA, despite the fact that they'd been working their entire lives. Um, their disability had left them defined as unemployable through the WPA. Um, deaf activists resisted this, and for a brief period, the WPA overturned itself and stated that deaf people were employable and could have work through the WPA. 
the WP then changed its mind again. Um, so, uh, so deaf people once again became unemployable through the WPA. Simply part of um, bureaucracy. But Mrs. DeMarco had said, employers don't seem interested in a deaf man, particularly her husband, and won't listen to us. I've been in the candy factory and halls trying to get on also, and they won't talk and just shake their head as if I were a freak. I wish I could make them understand we have to live like others, but it's awfully hard on us deaf, as they don't seem to care for a deaf person when they can get one who can hear. <coughs> That kind of employment discrimination and experience was very um, common. Then um, one other story about a woman, in essence, presumed the inability to work. This is a woman named Julia O'Brien who was an English teacher, um, high school English teacher. She had had polio as a kid and was a chair user. She, um, it sounds like, was um, a novel almost like an English teacher out of a novel. She was much loved. She was a single woman. She had been there forever. Um, she lived what she called a busy, active life. When World War II struck, as you might know, there were gasoline and, and um, rubber rationing. She had to drive to work. She could not walk to work the distance. Um, she drove to work. and. Um, when the tire rationing came, she, her tires were near their point of explosion. She was very worried, and she wrote and asked for an exemption to the board's tire so she could get another tire for her car and keep her job and not have to, in essence, be homeless, right, and, and workless um, on, a, on unemployment. And they told her four times no, that she could not have an exemption. Um, and she wrote to Franklin Roosevelt. And mm -hmm complained that they had told her that she had to sacrifice. There was a war going on. And she said, sacrifice, I think I know the meaning of the word. For 28 years, I have met the competition in my field and naturally had never asked or received special consideration because of my lameness. And later she went on. She was denied additional tire rations over and over and over again. She wrote, as I start the new school year, I rather envy the defense workers to whom the rationing boards are so rational. That defense workers could get exemptions, uh, but she could not. And um, I've done research, and hundreds and hundreds of people with disabilities wrote to FDR similarly asking for exemptions from the rationing for tires and for um, gasoline to keep their jobs um, because public transportation was not accessible and existed at all, and they wanted to keep their jobs, and they all said, no, I want to keep my job, I have to feed my family, I have to feed my loved ones, I don't want to go on unemployment, I don't want to go on the social welfare, I want to keep my job. And from what I can tell, none of them were granted exceptions. And I don't know what happened to them, and I don't know what happened to Julia O'Brien, um, but I wonder. But all of this has become, I think, because of the presumed presumption that people with disabilities can't labor despite the reality that they often did. Yeah. Was FDR's condition well known to the American public? You know, this is something people love to argue about. Um, I, from, I think many people did not. And FDR was promoted as someone who'd been cured entirely of polio. Um, I think that many people with mobility disabilities knew how to read FDR's body. They sent him, um, like recommendations on how to make improved wheelchairs, suggestions for adaptive equipment, pictures of the adaptive equipment they made all the time. So I think they knew, right? and many others knew. Um, so I think you know, Julia O'Brien may have been able to figure it out, but many people did not. But regardless, they really saw him as someone they hoped they'd have a better understanding from <coughs> because of his own experience with polio. Um, this is a picture of a gasoline rationing card, and unfortunately I don't have Julia O'Brien's, um, but this is what a gasoline rationing card looked like. Um, then I guess one more story, and then I want to add. And this is an example, I think, of disability activism, and it's also the ways in which, again, ideologies of disability intersect with other systems of power, like race or class or gender. Um, this was in 1979, 1978, there was a woman who was a 
an emerging disability rights activist in Minneapolis, St. Paul. She was a young woman, she was college educated, she was, um, it sounds like really fascinating, marvelous person that I would love to go out for supper with, one of those people. And um, she had been working in Minneapolis, St. Paul to get public transportation accessible. Um, she led this protest, which is one of the best protest posters I've ever read. Um, the Orchestral Hall had recently been renovated, but had not been made accessible, of course. And they made these big posters and had these rallies with 700 people down in downtown Minneapolis that said, the disabled need Mozart. <laughs> they said the handicapped, that was it. The handicapped need Mozart. But, um, one day in the winter of 1978, she was raped in her own And she called the police. She had been involved in the feminist movement as well. She called the police. She was quadriplegic. Minnesota law at that time required proof of physical resistance to prosecute rape. <coughs> the police caught the man who did it. It was sort of a classic stranger rape. Um, followed his footprints in the snow, middle of a Minnesota winter, arrested him, and ended up having to just let him go because she had not physically resisted. That's one of the quadriplegia. And there are lots of reasons why a woman might resist sexual assault, or might not resist sexual assault. Um, she, I, I talked to her, she talked about how the first year she just wept. After that, she decided she wanted to do something different than cry. She got um, together with DAs from the local counties, prosecuting attorneys. She got together with nursing home and institutional leaders within the county. She got together with feminist activists in the county. She got together with police officers in the county people involved in public transportation. They held a big conference to talk about sexual assault issues regarding people with disabilities. And they discovered at least 60 cases, almost all of them unreported, of a sexual assault of women with disabilities in Minneapolis, St. Paul, just in the previous year. And um, she's fascinating to me because she, she talked about the ways in which stereotypes about disability and gender women as ugly, as asexual, as shameful, um, made it hard for the person, average person, as she said in 1979, to accept the fact or even imagine that handicapped people are raped and beaten. Um, but they got together, this amazing group of activists from this really wide array of peoples, and said, we need to do something about this. They began to very successfully make um, sexual assault services and domestic violence shelters within the Minneapolis-St. Paul community accessible. They had um, special training regarding um, women with disabilities and sexual assault. They hired ASL interpreters for the first time. They made um, their materials much more accessible in a whole variety of ways. They began to talk about how to talk to people um, who are survivors who had cognitive disabilities or might not be verbal. Um, they did a whole variety of interesting things, and they also were able to change the law in Minnesota and not require proof of legal force or proof of physical resistance, um, and were very effective legally. Um, and I, I'm fascinated by this example, one, because it's so horrifying, I guess, but also because this was a woman who took the activism around disability issues, who took around her activism as a feminist, um, and brought people together to really change the law, to change culture, to work on issues of access for a whole variety of ways. And what she did mattered. What she did really, really mattered within the community, and it was important. Um, and she had consequence. Now again, I'd love to keep you here for days so we could go through everything. Um, but I won't, you know, I guess that, one of the, a couple things I want to leave you with is that disability is omnipresent. It's everywhere in US, U.S. history once we start looking for it. And I believe that it matters. And it matters because the, that inclusion of people with disabilities is an issue of democracy. But it also matters because this is part of all of our stories. Um, that all of us have lives that intersect with the history of disability. Um, and it's one in which all of us have been and all of our family members were there, and our ancestors were there. Um, and we
we have lived out right, the struggles for democracy as a nation. We're all part of those struggles for democracy um, and inclusion in the nation. I just thought I'd end with this. Um, Martin Luther King quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Um, here's, this is Justin Dart, um, who is one of the um, energies, I guess, behind the Americans with Disabilities Act. He's dead now. Um, is, um, was a marvelous guy with sort of, with a, who always wore a cowboy hat. Um, <laughs> this is another one of my historical questions. Surely I've got issues I've got to deal with. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming out tonight, and I'm looking forward to talking with Doug and all of you as well. studies and disability studies. So which came first? <laughs> well, what that really means is I go to a lot of meetings. <laughs> um, honestly, for me, I think uh, my interest in history um, came first. Um, I'm an accidental historian also. I hated history all through high school. I'm sorry if you're a high school teacher. Um, in my experience, we did war helping. Right. Um, and I, I didn't like it. I got to college and I just fell in love. Um, and, but I became really, I, and I fell into disability history by accident also. Um, but I, I, I really love it and I hope that comes through. And I also really think it matters. And I think it's also a way in which we can talk about power and gender and race and, um, the nation all at the same time, really, really well through, and smartly through disability history. Yeah, I think that one of the other things that really came uh, through for me being, and I'm not even a historian, I'm an accidental okay. historian, I'm just, you know, I've, I've worked in the field for 28 so years, you know, and got a chance to take my art background and look at different depictions of disability throughout time, and like you said, wherever you look, there it is, whether it's Tiny Tim, whether it's a picture of the Down Syndrome children that you can see down in the gallery and the religious icon paintings, but also the language. And the language that defaults to, when in doubt, make it a masculine pronoun, and uh, tying together uh, uh, slavery, women's suffrage, and that's why I like the Frances Willard thing. And that's why I pointed out Frances Willard was, because she's not only women's suffrage, she was uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union, but she also had kind of overtones against equality for you know, African Americans because it tied in with the uh, anti-alcohol feelings and of course it was you know, scary African American men are going to be raping all the white women once they get out there by police. So part of your story is the story of self-identity in a society that's wants to label you. What, what have you seen has been effective for a disability community to fight against labeling? I think one, for people with a variety of disabilities to work together. And that's been a post-World War II phenomenon, that rather than just blind people being activists for blind people, deaf for deaf people, um, that people across a wide variety of disabilities working together I think really matters and, and fights that labeling. Um, and the, then I, I guess one thing that hasn't worked <laughs> is the effort to say, I'm not disabled, so don't count me out, but really those people are. That does, I, that really, I think does, that does a lot of harm in the long run. Um, I think the willingness to be public helps. Um, the effort to claim your own name. You have to self-identify. Yeah, it really matters. Um, I think all of us fight shame inside ourselves, regardless of who we are. And um, that's a personal 
battle as well as a public political battle. But I think it's a battle that matters. Finding community. Well, yeah, and, well, to be recognized by the community is one way to find your place within that community or have the community value what you do. A lot of us, to, just to generalize, not the sociology type either, a lot of us tend to self-identify through our vocation. I was really glad that you touched upon employment. What do you see are some of the successes in employment for people with disabilities and some of the barriers that remain for employment of individuals with disabilities? I think there's still a lot of discrimination against people with disabilities in employment, and there's still often very low expectations. Um, I think because of that, the Americans Act with Disabilities Act really, really matters. The law helps. The law helps, and the fact that it is illegal to do so has consequence. Um, and we can't hesitant about filing lawsuits and fighting that discrimination. The law is really, really important. Yeah, the ADA is coming up on 25 years old next year. Mm -hmm. It's really a, a chance to celebrate, but it's also a chance to almost like kick it out of mom and dad's basement so that they can stand on its own and earn its, uh, earn its, earn its uh, stripes as a the same way with different civil rights or other, other minority movements have. What are some ways that you're helping to promote the ADA? The anniversary? Yeah, um, you're all supposed to have parties, okay? Um, 2015, the 20th, 25th anniversary of the ADA, so um, I'm telling everybody to have a party, okay, with cake. Um, <laughs> there are national efforts uh, right now to honor the 25th anniversary of the ADA. Um, there are events scheduled for the mall in Washington, D.C. Um, there will be traveling exhibits, and I suspect you're doing marvelous things here. Um, well, we're actually working with the Center for Disability Studies at UB yeah. to hopefully be the regional hub for all things ADA next year. That's great. Yeah. And um, I know that the Carter Center for Human Rights is planning a lot around the anniversary of the ADA. Um, the Smithsonian is as well. Um, I, you know, I think it has the potential to really remind people that this matters, to bring the issue of civil rights to the forefront for a whole variety of people. Um, one last question before I throw it to the, uh, the crowd. Hey, Doug. Yep. I'm, yes. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. <coughs> just, just to make you aware, uh, the Center for Independent Living in Western New York uh, does an annual picnic uh, to celebrate the ADA, uh, and we'll be doing so again this July 25th or 26th. Uh, well, I think the 26th, it, it falls on Saturday, so they're going to be planning for Friday. Or, yeah. Uh, and I know that they're also planning a, for a big celebration for next year, too. So just for everybody's information. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. You've written two books on this uh, subject, Helen Keller. Icon in American disability advocacy, legal rights for people who are marginalized and she'll go found the ACLU. When her statue was put in Congress, she's depicted as the little girl with the water pump in her hand. What does that tell you about society's need to evolve beyond people with disabilities are returning to children? Yeah. I, um so I think there are two statues of women in the U.S. Capitol um, that represent states. One of them is Helen Keller as a child. Um, and she lived to be 88 years old. Um, and I don't know about you, but if I live to be 88, I don't want to be remembered for what I did at the age of seven. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that very much we still think about people with disabilities as eternal children. I also think that we're very uncomfortable with Helen Keller as an adult who had political views and sometimes very sharp political views and who um, was a sexual person as well. <coughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Um, you know, that we tend not to think, I think, particularly about women with disabilities in that fashion. Um, yeah, I think that was, you know, I, I'm rah-rah about the Helen Keller statue, but I'm, it's frustrating that it was a as a child. She would not have approved it. <laughs> I had that feeling too. We recently did an exhibit with the help of Dr. Ramdasan, um, 
poster children in general depicting, you know, what, and, and one of the things, one of the scary things is that if you let, if you start imagining people with disabilities as anything but needy and dependent, oh my God, you got to give them rights. Yeah. So, um, that's, I, I think that, you know, it, it's a great time to open up for questions to the audience for um, Kim. If you have any questions about her book, including maybe you're going to have another book up your sleeve, you know, <laughs> or something coming down the pipe, I'm glad you have to hear your questions. Yes. Did you know that before the start of the Great Recession in 2007, the U.S. Labor Department did that persons with disabilities plus one expected. One and two were working. Comes the Great Recession, one in four are working. Today, less than one in four are working. But why is that? Well, the employers went ahead and ran algorithms. They, under HIPAA, nobody knows what your disability is, etc. They ran an algorithm, algorithms, consulting companies, and figured out where blocks of people were hired and their insurance rates went up. Oh, okay, get rid of this block, get rid of this block. And it's like, okay, so what good was the ADA and the Social Security Rehabilitation Act? Didn't matter. Because legally, well, if you could reverse engineer who, who raised your insurance rates, okay, they're gone. And we're not hiring them back. That's discouraging. And, and in mental health, it's even worse. They, 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 they're like, you know, it's like, you know, like, you know, like peers. One in ten women. Who know why? Because there's this, what, fear that people are going to act out, cause problems. Uh, but what's the worst thing when someone under stress happens? They just get confused. I had to have them read it and I'm terrible. Making lunch and I was like, okay, I just went wow. And I need 10 minutes out because I can't put it together. And uh, I used to be able to do higher mathematics and the disease took that away. So I just went, okay, well, 10 minutes later, come back, I'm fine. But employers are not allowed for that. Employment, it can really matter. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for those 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 statistics. You know, that's really discouraging to find that employment rates are falling. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I currently work at a Catalonian Learning Center, which is an agency that services students that can't be. Uh, otherwise serviced in the district. And uh, I was having a discussion with the director of education there, and there's a movement, and they just, they passed it in Rhode Island, where they're trying to get rid of vocational workshops to include everybody in the, in the general mainstream, try to get them out of employment. What is your opinion on, do you think it's too soon? Do you, do you think there's a need for vocational training in terms of workshops? Or do you think it's actually a good idea to just throw them out in the mainstream to get them into employment, to try to include them in society. Because we're all for inclusion. But. Right. Well, I think nobody should just be thrown out there. Right? None of us yeah. can do that. Um, and you know, the Supreme Court ruled in Olmstead that, that the most integrated context possible is what is necessary, as far as the law goes. Um, and, and I'm doing the wimpy washy wishy with the answer and saying that this isn't my area of expertise, but I think that um, the more integrated we can make work and society, the better. But that um, we need to think about what the most integrated situation is for, for everybody. Um, and what supports all of us need to do well in the workplace, to do well in our relationships, to do well um, in educational settings, we, all of us need supports in those settings, and we need to really think about what those supports are, and then we need to provide those, because I think too often, um, put this down or I'll spill it. Um, I think too often in the shutting down of support services like that, it's either the old form of the support services, or we just leave people out there. Right? And, mm -hmm. and I don't think either one of those are ideal, that we need to figure out um, the best way to offer support in the least restrictive environment. Because I hate to just see people thrown out there. None of us can do that. Yeah. 
so there's some degree of transition that needs to be made between <coughs> the sheltered workshop, which used to be for kids from 19 to 65, mm -hmm. and you know, rather than just saying, "Here, go, you know, go get a job." I mean, shoving somebody out on a four-lane highway is not mobility training. So yeah. I think there has to be some. But I do think that there's an issue right now around um, sheltered workshops in terms of hours of employment, but particularly your wages. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there was a money thing. That's what, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, what it came down to, unfortunately. Because yeah. Haley shouldn't have those workshops, but they changed the, I forgot what the title was, but it used to be called workshop, and they changed the title of it in order to keep getting funds and money into it. And which the director of education knows it's coming down the pipe where they're going to have to get rid of them. I actually work at the Catalician Workshop. Oh, you yeah. yeah, and they're trying to, from what my understanding is, they're trying to take away the revocational, like you said, the sheltered um, employment. My fear is that there are individuals there that have been there years and years, and as much as we would like to put them, you know, into a where we have on sites that we're working with, companies that you know we're bringing our people there and working there, it's not safe for a lot of them because they, with their disability, they are not able to um, watch basically something as simple as watching for forklifts, making sure you stay in this lane, you know, and it, it's to me it's going to be a huge challenge to be able to get all those people out. I feel that they need to look at each individual person. Uh, you know, you can't just make a general law and say, get rid of sheltered employment. Because I think they have to look at each individual person and make a decision based on that person's abilities. Because some, you know, may end up just stuck at home if we don't have that sheltered employment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this whole conversation, and, and I want to refer back to something in the book um, where you, at the opening chapter of the book is about pre-colonial America and looking at indigenous people's cultures <coughs> and how disability was dealt with so differently. So it gives you an idea that what's disabling or is different. So if people can contribute to a society, they people contribute in different ways, right? And we have a society where we don't really take care of each other, right? Everything's a commodity, including us. So I think that's part of what people are speaking to because, I mean, I have a good friend who, in between other things, sometimes will work at a workshop. But, you know, I mean, really, people are totally exploited most of the time in terms of the wages that they, you can't really live on that. Um, then one workshop is closed and a friend of hers really doesn't have a job, right? So, I mean, it's, and it doesn't mean that things weren't set up at a time to try to do something, I, I'm not sure, but we're not thinking outside the box because there's a recession, less people are working, more people are competing for less paying jobs. So as a society, it, it means a different approach to what it means to be citizens. Yeah, and the contributions, of, I, I think we have to think differently about the what we consider to be a contribution to society. And that? Um, to actually pick up on that question, um, I was wondering more generally, um, since we were just talking about work and how we oftentimes center work and what we label as work and what we don't see as work, right? Um, even from a feminist perspective, the care work that women do and um, reproductive work, you know, those who are allowed to um, do that. Um, so in your experience as a historian, is there, have you come across a lot of um, maybe disability activism about a basic wage, uh, you know, a restructuring of the way we remunerate um, what people do, how they quote unquote contribute to society? Um, and then I had a more general question too for you, just, I haven't read your book, but how did you, since you showed us, um, in how many ways disability was used to, um, 
you know, specifically curtail um, the activities and lives of specific kinds of people, which in the end were almost almost everybody, right? Yeah. In some one way or another. How did you decide what to include in your book and what to leave out? Because you really could have written about pretty much everything. Yeah. Well, regarding wages, um, maybe if I can go back to the non-wage work, um, there's this historian named Daniel Blackie who's done work on disabled revolutionary war veterans. Mm -hmm. And he's discovered that amongst those who did not work for wages, the vast majority of these men did immense care work in their homes. They cared for grandchildren, they cared for their own children, they cared for their mothers and their grandfathers, and they did the housework. And you know, regardless of whatever kind of disability they had after the war, they did immense non-wage work. And I think we have to think about that important non-wage work. Um, I mean, I found instances of people trying to unionize sheltered workshops as early as the 1960s. Um, and actually some small, I mean, really two sheltered workshops in Iowa that were unionized in the early 1970s, um, which is fascinating to me. And I, I haven't been able to figure out that whole story at all yet of what they did and how that happened and what happened to those workplaces and those people. Um, but I, I think that um, we need to rethink about those things. Yeah, so how I chose topics. Um, yeah, I, I would be honest that um, I had moments of really panic, a huge panic as I was writing this book, of how do you write about, you know, what, 800 years of history of an entire continent, <laughs> well, including the whole spectrum of things considered to be disability and talking about all different racial groups, economic groups, ethnic groups, sexuality, gender, and in our short book that's readable and that people will look at, right, rather than the 800 page tome. Um, yeah, I had some real panic moments. Um, you know, I told myself that I did not have to do everything in every single chapter, okay, that I consider the whole book. Um, I, um, I was stuck using the materials that I could find. <laughs> I couldn't make things up, right? So, so that helped me. Um, I feel it's very important, and all historians and writers use different strategies. It was important to me that this book be as accessible as possible. And I, um, I really believe that the longer the book is, the less accessible it is in many cases. Um, and so I wanted to keep it short. Um, Historians always struggle with where to begin. Um, as I talk to people about this book, my editor and I and many other historians have had conversations about where to start. Many assumed that I would start with the creation of institutions for people with disabilities in US history. Um, other people assumed I would start with the 19, or 1776, the creation of the United States. Most assumed I would start at the time of European arrival and conquest. Um, I felt very strongly that I needed to start prior to European arrival and recognize that North America existed prior to European arrival. Um, so that's why the first chapter is entirely prior to European arrival. And, um, you know, so it was one of balance and trying to fit everything in and recognizing that I can't do everything and hoping that other people would fill in the holes and generate excitement and ideas. Um, and honestly, it also were the question of which stories charm me and affected me and kept me awake at night, that those were the stories that I chose. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Along that last point, um, Um, so hopefully I did that. Um, 
I found that when I would deal with big issues like, oh, I want to talk about industrialization, that I would just get lost and panicked and people would be lost. That when I could go and find a specific person and tell their story, that then I could go off and talk about industrialization. But to stay with people and their stories and their lives and how they defined themselves really mattered. Um, I do think it's important sometimes, and historians ride the, li ride the line between sensationalizing people and exploiting them, and I, I hope I never did that. I think good for me, and looking, I'm looking at people in the 1870s through, and it's you know, that thing, accounts of people that are often forgotten, yeah. that are then the way they're covered in newspaper journalism. What was the motivation in telling the story? Do you think society in general is moving forward compared to where we were in previous times, or do you see like a previous civilization that we're just so far ahead of where we are right now? I don't think that history is the march of constant progress. Yeah. It is not. Um, I do think that, um, well, one, you know, I apologize. I am the glass half full perpetually optimistic person. <coughs> it's a curse. Um, but I do think that the, the, the civil rights legislation of the last 40, 50 years has been incredibly important in improving the lives of people with disabilities and their friends and colleagues and loved ones and all of us. And I think that that has, those civil rights pieces of, in, of integration have really important and a good consequences. Um, and I think, I'm gonna sound like a song, but the integration of particularly children in schools, I think uh, children with disabilities is having consequence in that more and more children are growing up, whether they're disabled or not disabled, but fully integrated with other children with disabilities or not in their lives. Um, and I, I guess I told the story at Mark's, Mark's class the other day, but I was in a second grade classroom a year ago eating lunch with them in those little bitty chairs. <laughs> and um, one of the little girls had just gotten this, a new wheelchair that was hot pink and the wheels had little sparkles mm -hmm. as they turned. And the, the conversation at the second grade lunch table was what color wheelchair everyone would choose when they got to pick out their wheelchairs. And I was really, really fascinated by that conversation. Um, because I think in a much, they thought, those kids, at least at that moment in second grade, thought about disability in a very different way than if they'd lived prior to 1973, right, when, kids, when there was integrated schools began to start regarding disability, um, and even prior to the ADA. Um, so I tend to be optimistic about um, the increased and ever-increasing integration of people with disabilities um, and what that means for all of us. Um, I, don't, I think that is not universal. This is not a story of universal progress, and there are clearly setbacks and in individual circumstances. Um, I think we still live in an overwhelmingly ableist society, just overwhelmingly ableist. Um, but I, I think it's better than it was 50 years ago. So maybe different legislation, integration, and opportunities <laughs> changing what the definition of able is might get the society some other more utopian or at least egalitarian place that you know, maybe we want to go. Anybody else have any other questions? Yes. Right. There, there have been a number, a number of pieces of legislation throughout the past now four or five decades. Um, what, what do you feel is the most important piece? I, I haven't read your yeah. book either, so I just... Yeah. yeah. Um, I, you kind of brought up the IDEA, I, and but... You know, I, I, I don't know. You know, it might be the IDA, the individual, um, the Education Act of 1973. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. You know, that um, school districts could no longer turn away kids with disabilities. I mean, think about that. Prior to 1973, school districts could turn away any kid they considered to have a disability. Now, not all did, or some hand-picked, cherry-picked, but think about that. That's not that long ago. Um, I think that's an incredibly important piece of legislation. 
Um, even I was alive then. Um, and we talked about this earlier. A lot of people overlook Brown versus Board of Education and the impact it's had on the disability community, other rather than just a strict, a strictly ethnic or racial type, type of impact on society. So, not being able to segregate people at the threat of withholding funding, which actually all can't get children education for all. That, that's what it's really about. So sometimes. It's the sphere of economic deprivation that drives society in the right direction. If anybody has any more questions, going once, <laughs> going twice. Kim's book is available downstairs. Just a real quick question. Do you have an audio book? <laughs> My understanding is that. Um, Beacon is working at this. I'm published with Beacon and Random House, and they're supposed to have that out in the next six months. Oh, cool. I tried to do that right away, and they wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> so again, we'd like to let you know that we're going to be open until 9. We'd like to have you take the chance to you know, speak one-on-one -on -one with our author and special guest, Kim Nielsen. Your uh, admission here or your membership here allows you to take a, a nice walk through the gallery. Um, thank you for coming, and how about another round of applause? For you?